Welcome. Well, howdy, y'all. Welcome to Texas Talking. You know, it's rainy and stormy here in Texas, but I want to welcome you to the Texas Talking Podcast. Anyway, I am your host, Teresa Holbrook O'Dowd, and welcome to episode four. In this episode, we are going to learn about Texas tornadoes. You know, it may be June, but in Texas, it's tornado season. May and June are the peak months for tornadoes in Texas. Though tornadoes can happen any time of the year here in Texas, these months remain some of the most active period for tornadoes. So in this episode of Texas Talking, we are going to learn about some of the worst tornadoes in Texas history, as well as some of the twisters that made an impression on me, and also how you can prepare for tornado season here in Texas. But first, let me tell you a bit about the Texas Talking Podcast. You know, as a native Texan, I wanted to bring you a podcast about Texas. So in each episode, I will bring you stories, information, and interviews about the history, culture, legend, mystique that is Texas. While Texas is known for its hot weather, barbecue, cowboy hats, and large size, What else do you really know about Texas? If you are a Texan, a Texan at heart, or just a curious bypasser who would like to know more about the Lone Star State, then you're in the right place. No topic is off limits, as this podcast will explore everything from Texas-style cuisine, attractions, places to visit, historical sites and figures, as well as topics suggested by you, my audience. So, how can you participate in the show? How can you send me questions that you would like for me to ask or do a show about? Well, there's a couple of ways. First, you can head on over to my website, texastalkin.com. That's Texas, no space, talkin, T-A-L-K-I-N, dot com, to find out more about the show. You can also subscribe to the podcast at Spotify, Podbean, YouTube, Facebook, or by just simply going to the Texas Talking website. I do need your help and support to keep the show going. I hope that you will join us every two weeks for new episodes, like us on Facebook, give us some five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts, and support us at Patreon so that we can remain on the air commercial-free. That's Patreon, P A. T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Texas Talkin and click on become a patron. You can support the podcast each month for as little as a dollar a month and it will help me to keep the show on the air. I want to thank the following patrons for their support. Emma F. Richard H. Thomas G. Richard O. Jared O. Now, let's get on with the show. It's spring in Texas, and that means the birds are chirping, days last longer, the grass and weeds are growing, and most Texans are on the lookout for severe weather. In Texas, at least where I live in north-central Texas, spring not only brings a relief from colder temperatures, but it also produces storms that are likely to include thunder, lightning, rain, hail, and high winds. Of course, that's if we're lucky because Texas weather is also known for spring tornadoes. According to the Texas Almanac, there are an average of 132 tornadoes that touch down in Texas each year. While the annual total varies considerably and certain areas are struck more often than others, tornadoes occur with the greatest frequency in the Red River Valley of North Texas. You might ask why Texas Well, according to Scientific American, it has everything to do with the unique geography of North America. According to Harold Brooks, head of the Mesoscale Applications Group at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's National Severe Storms Laboratory in Norman, Oklahoma, if that's not a mouthful, the kind of storms that produce tornadoes are most likely to occur when the horizontal winds in the atmosphere increase in speed 
and change with increasing altitude. What the heck does that mean? Well, I'm not exactly sure what it means, but this often happens in Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas as surface winds come from the direction of the Gulf of Mexico, bringing in warm, moist air. If you do a quick Google search for famous Texas tornadoes, you will for famous Texas tornadoes, you will find a top 10 list of the worst tornadoes in Texas history listed by weather.gov. The site lists the worst recorded tornadoes in Texas history as being the Waco, the Waco tornado of 1953, the Goliad tornado of 1902, the Rock Springs tornado of 1927, the Glacier Higgins Woodward tornadoes of 1947, the Wichita Falls tornado of 1979, the Frost tornado of 1930, the Carnes DeWitt tornado of 1930, the Zephyr Tornado of 1909, the Saragossa Tornado of 1987, and the Gerald Tornado of 1997, of 1997, with the Lubbock Tornado of 1970 as an honorable mention. Chances are, if you lived in Texas for at least 20 years, you have had some encounter with a tornado. Now, that's not to say that a tornado destroyed your house and property, but you may have at least seen one at a distance or heard of neighbors, relatives, or nearby communities that have suffered the damaging effects of a Texas storm that contained a tornado. Now, many of these tornadoes on the top 10 worst tornado list happened before my time, but a few of them made such a lasting impression on my family that I've at least heard about them. According to weather.gov, the deadliest tornado in Texas since 1900 is listed as the Waco tornado that occurred on May 11, 1953. It lists this violent and deadly tornado as ripping through downtown Waco and killing 114 people and injuring 597. The twister was listed as an F5 and it was said to have destroyed over 600 homes and damaged over a thousand businesses, including the Dr. Pepper bottling plant, which still stands in Waco today. 2,000 vehicles sustained damage and the monetary damages topped 41 million in 1953, which today probably equates somewhere around 310 million or something of that nature. I've often wondered if the tornado scene in the 1984 movie, Places in the Heart, might have been modeled after the Waco tornado. A quick search on the story of writer-director Robert Benton's great-grandfather, who lived in the 1880s. Given the setting of the movie and the story's roots in Waxahachie, only miles north of Waco, the awesome display of nature when the tornado rips through the small Texas town could have very well been based on any number of Texas tornadoes, including the Waco tornado, despite what the internet says, or the tornado reported in the Waxahachie Daily Light that hit Waxahachie and surrounding areas and killed 16 on a Wednesday afternoon, May 7, 1930. The intensity of a tornado is based on the Fujita scale, or F scale. It was originally developed by Dr. Tetsuya Ted Fujita to estimate wind Ted Fujita to estimate wind speeds of the tornado, and it is based on the damage left by the storm. According to weather.gov, who was kind of my go-to for this podcast, no one knows the true wind speeds at ground level of most tornadoes. So the F scale is used by most meteorologists and wind engineers to provide an educated guess based on the damage left. The F scale ranges from an F zero or wind speeds from 65 to 85 miles per hour 
to an F5 tornado with wind speeds of over 200 miles per hour. Now, as for me, I can remember at least six terrifying tornadoes in my lifetime, and really probably more, but six that really stand out. And none of these tornadoes threatened my life, but they all made me appreciate the awesome power and devastation that can be born out, or in devastation, that can be born out of a Texas thunderstorm when that cold and warm air collide. While a tornado can happen almost anywhere, it just seems like Texas is particularly susceptible to the damaging and deadly storms. And in particular, where I live in north central Texas, um, they just occur. Now, to be honest, it seems like we had more uh, violent tornadoes when I was younger, and it seems like there's a few less occurring in, in north central area and more in Oklahoma nowadays. But one of the earliest tornadoes I can remember happened to touch ground just a few miles southwest of Pottsburg, Texas, off Hagerman Road. It was probably sometime in the early 70s <clears throat> because I was a child living with my parents in our home directly located behind my parent parents' business. They own and ran one of the few convenience stores located in the small rural community of Pottsboro, Texas, just south of Lake Texoma and north of Perrin Air Force Base. It was probably a school day because I remember I was up early getting ready for something. That makes me think it was probably school. When one of our regular customers, Mrs. Towery, a nurse who lived near the rural community of Hagerman, had driven to my father's store to request that he and my mother call an ambulance. She said she had just driven past the Wilson's house and it was completely blown away, all except for the small bathroom in the center of the house where Ricky Wilson and his wife Maria and their infant child Stephanie were tucked away trying to survive the tornado. Another tornado I witnessed in the mid-70s, and again, I still lived in that same convenience store, uh, was a late afternoon when my mother called me and my friend Lori Peters. It was in late afternoon when my mother called me and my friend Lori Peters to the front of the store to view a small twister touching down and spewing debris about three miles northwest of our store. At that time, I was scared to death. The storm looked like it was heading directly for us. So I ran back into the living room and began to pray. Something my friend would later reveal to my class the next day. And my teacher would say that that's about all you can do when faced by a tornado. Thank you, teacher. The storm was likely an F1 tornado and it didn't actually do very much damage. It managed to tear a few shingles from rooftops of the homes that it touched down. I definitely remember from my childhood because I saw it. The next tornado I clearly remember is the one that hit Wichita Falls in 1979. Now, I wasn't living in Wichita Falls, but I remember it because I had spent a week in Wichita Falls the, in the summer of 1973 with my sister and her family. They were living there um, just over the summer while her husband worked as an engineer for the Katy Railroad. She had her first son, Chad, one of my first nephews, and he was probably about 18 months old. And I had spent um, several weeks during the summer with them, and I just remember spending a lot of time at a swimming pool that was located near their house that they were renting uh, on those hot summer days and listening to the radio. Um, Little did I think about that in, in a mere six years, an F4 tornado would touch down, an F4 tornado would touch down and severely damage the city of Wichita Falls. It touched down close to, it touched down close to the Memorial Stadium, followed by um, some damage it did to McDill Junior High, and then it entered the residential part of the city. And according to the weather.com website, the tornado went on damaging a shopping center, numerous vehicles, and proceeded across US 287 where it destroyed additional vehicles. 
at at times it was reported to be a mile to a mile and a half wide. It continued northeast from Wichita Falls past the Red River and on into Oklahoma where it eventually dissipated. In all, that deadly tornado killed 42 people in Wichita Falls. 25 of those deaths were vehicle related. It caused 1,700 it caused 1,700 injuries, destroyed over 3,000 homes, and left 20,000 people homeless. Another tornado that's on my list of memorable tornadoes is the tornado that hit downtown Fort Worth on March 28th of 2000. Now again, I wasn't living in Fort Worth, but I remember this tornado mainly because it was the first tornado that I can recall that had hit a large downtown area. In fact, before the Fort Worth tornado, there were some urban legends that existed that tornadoes usually would track away from large cities because of their skyscrapers. Well, that myth got busted because that tornado in 2000, um, it began kind of as a weak storm, but gradually became stronger as it tracks out easterly and then eastwardly toward downtown Fort Worth Central Business District. Luckily enough, it was late enough in the evening that most people that worked in downtown Fort Worth had already left their businesses. Eventually, the, the uh, tornado would become an F3, and it would leave a path of destruction that included 266 homes across a four-mile-long path that included major damage to various high-rise and low-rise buildings in downtown Fort Worth. Particularly hard hit was the Bank One building, in which 80% of its windows were broken. Two people lost their lives as a direct result of the tornado. A man was killed while trying to reach shelter after warning others about the tornado. And a homeless man was killed when a wall uh, collapsed on him. There were reportedly some, uh, of, some other 80 people injured, but only six of those 80 required hospitalization. I remember driving down to Fort Worth, um, probably with my, my family, my husband um, and child, and just driving by those skyscrapers and noticing all the broken windows and damage. It was truly an amazing sight. Yet another of the many tornadoes that I remember but it's not among that top 10 list in the Texas history. Um, it really made a lasting impression on me, um, mainly because of its close proximity to where my family and I were living in 2015. Ends up it was only an F1 tornado with winds ranging from 95 to 100 miles per hour, but it moved through uh, Grayson County, Texas, where I lived, right across from the small community of Hal, Texas. It happened uh, during the night on a Tuesday, April 26, 2016. And according to the, the NATO was moving northeasterly uh, as it crossed U.S. Highway 75, touching down and destroying multiple metal storage buildings at um, a business called Winslow Custom Buildings. Now, this business was just right across a highway, Highway 5, from Howe High School, where I was actually uh, an employee uh, of the school district, not just of Howe High School. And the twister touched down, and the twister touched down again as it passed the high school, uh, heading east of town, damaging multiple houses, including the house of Terry Calhoun and Michael and Clarissa Doty, of whom I knew quite well. Uh, Clarissa Doty worked at the school with me. According to an article published on the DFWCBSlocal.com website, the day after the storm, Calhoun described the storm as sounding like a roar or something as it woke her, her husband and made a really loud sound. Uh, in fact, many survivors of tornadoes often compare the sound of a tornado to that of a large freight train, although some do occasionally describe the storm as like a roaring of a loud uh, jet engine. Now, there's a lot of other storms that I remember in my lifetime. Uh, I have to tell the story that um, I stayed a lot with two of my aunts. I stayed a lot with two of my aunts that lived close to the lake, and they had a storm shelter in front of their house. We called it a cellar. 
And any time um, there was lightning or thunder, we would go and get in that that uh, storm shelter because they were deadly afraid of storms. My mother too was pretty afraid of storms, um, but we lived in a, a, a prefabricated home kind of built of concrete and my dad just really wasn't afraid of storms so we would usually try to sleep through them but I do remember the night that um, one of my um, older sisters got married we uh, actually were able to climb up on our rooftop and watch tornadoes as they were dropping down uh, probably about five to eight miles south of our home and we watched those tornadoes drop out of the sky and then pop back up into the sky as as tornadoes often do um um at going across going across the parent air force base another uh, kind of close call that i remember is when um i was home alone with my two children and they were relatively small at the time i think one was about four and the other was maybe around um Oh, probably 11 or 12. And we heard on the uh, KXII um, weather station, that was a local weather station that I could get, that a tornado was coming across the community where I lived. And we actually got down inside uh, our house in the hallway um, because our bathroom was kind of on an out, outer side of the of our house. We got down in a hallway and covered ourselves up with... Um, blankets and comforters uh, to try to keep debris from damaging us if if it did in fact hit our house. We learned later that the tornado had touched down before it got to our house and touched down after it got past past our house, but was was not, we were in the direct path, but the tornado was back up in the sky when it crossed over the area uh, where our house stood. So tornadoes are really tricky. So what should you do if you hear that um, your community, the community where you live, is under a tornado watch or a tornado warning. Well, the first thing you really need to know is the difference between a watch and a warning. Um, according to the National Weather Service, they describe a tornado watch as you need to be prepared. Tornadoes are possible in the near um, area, in the watch area. A tornado warning means that a tornado uh, has been sighted, or that it's indicated on a weather radar, and there are there's like an uh, imminent threat to life and property. So if it's a watch, you need to be aware. If it's a warning, you probably need to take cover, being prepared for a tornado. They say to be weather ready, which basically means check your forecast regularly to see if you're at the risk of tornadoes. They also recommend that you sign up for weather alerts and notifications with your local weather service or sometimes your community. Um, you should create what they call a communication plan for you and your family that kind of includes a place to meet in the case of an emergency. Particularly sometimes after a tornado, people get scattered, debris is scattered, it's hard to get to your family. So if you have a communication plan, you'll kind of know how to get in touch with one another. You need to pick a safe room in your home or identify a nearby safe building you can get into quickly. So if you live in a mobile home, you need to seek shelter outside of that mobile home. Uh, the National Weather Service recommends maybe a church or a family member's house that you can get to quickly. A family member's house that you can get to quickly because you don't want to be in your car if a tornado is coming through. You need to practice your plan before any storms. And you also want to prepare your home. You know, not all homes in Texas have cellars, basements. Very few homes in Texas have basements, particularly in the north central Texas area where the ground is just, it gets really hot and it cracks and expands in the summer. And then in the winter, we have more wet weather. So it's just not the ideal conditions for um, basements in your home. But you can have a safe room built inside your home. And if you don't have one, you might consider adding one. Finally, uh, if something does happen, you want to be prepared to help your neighbor and encourage loved ones to get prepared for tornadoes so that no one ever gets hurt in a tornado. Uh, the last thing that they suggest is take CPR is take CPR training because it never hurts to have training such as CPR training. If you do get out after a tornado and you see other people's hurt, 
you might be able to assist. So that's kind of what to do before a tornado. But what can you do if you find yourself in the middle of a tornado? Like you hear the warning and you look outside and you see one and you're just kind of in the middle of it. Well, this is what the National Weather Service recommends if you find yourself in a tornado. Again, they tell you to stay weather ready and alert. So they tell you to continue to listen to your local news or if you have a NOAA weather radio, keep that close to you so you can stay up to date on watches and warnings. If you are at home in a tornado warning, they tell you you should go to your safe room, basement if you have it. If you don't have either one of those, you want to go to an interior room away from windows. And don't forget your if you have time, if time allows. If you find yourself at work or school or maybe even out shopping, you want to follow the tornado drill procedures of that business or, or that the place you're at. Um, you want to proceed to a tornado shelter as quickly and calmly as possible. Again, the main thing to do is to stay away from windows where glass and debris can, can get to you. Uh, and don't go into like large open rooms such as cafeterias, gymnasiums, or auditoriums. Hallways are good. Interior rooms are good. Bathrooms are the best, especially if they're in uh, an interior room. If you're on the second or third floor, you might want to consider getting into like a stairwell, but not an elevator. Um, if you are outside and you see a tornado approaching, you want to seek shelter inside in a sturdy building if at all possible, and you want to do, want to do that immediately. Stay away again from things like sheds and storage facilities. They're usually not safe, particularly mobile homes, and you do want to get out of that car if at all possible. Um, obviously, if you're camping and you're in a tent or like a, a travel trailer, you want to try to get out of that. And if you have time, you want to get to a safe building. Uh, if you are in a vehicle or a travel trailer or mobile home mm -hmm. and you see a tornado and you can't get to a safe building, then your best bet is to try to drive to the closest shelter if that appears to be a safe thing to do. Otherwise, if you're unable to make it to a safe shelter, you just want to get down and cover your head, abandon your car, and seek shelter in like a low-lying area like a ditch or ravine. But I would, I would caution you <laughs> too about ditches and ravines um, because usually tornadoes are either preceded by or followed by heavy water preceded by or followed by heavy rain. So you don't want to drown. So a ditch or ravine if it's dry enough, uh, otherwise just a low lying area. After a tornado, the National Weather Service advises that you continue to stay informed. You continue to listen to your local news, stay updated. Uh, sometimes one tornado will pass through and not too long after that, there will be another one. Also, a lot of times tornadoes will knock down power lines. So you, you want to have like a weather radio that is battery operated, if at all possible. Uh, maybe your cell phone. Let your family and friends know that you're okay um, so that they can help spread the word. If you have a cell phone, you can use text messages or social media. If um, that is something that's possible, you might even could call them if, if at all possible. But after the threat, after the tornado has in, ended, you do want to check your property to see if it's damaged. Um, be careful though when you're walking through storm damage. You would want to wear long pants and there can be power lines that are down. You just want to be careful. Contact your local authorities to see if power lines are down. And if there are damaged buildings, stay out of those. Um, be aware that there also can be insurance scammers after property damage. You know, just Someone driving by saying they'll fix your roof for uh, for $500, and once you give them the $500, you never see them again. So do be aware of scammers. And then finally, help your neighbors out. Uh, if you come across people that are injured and you are properly trained, you know, you can provide first aid at least until an emergency team uh, arrives. And then if you need some more information about um, tornado safety, a good place to go is your National Weather Service. Uh, their website is uh, weather.gov forward slash safety forward slash tornado. And I will post this in my show notes on the um, on my website, texastalkin.com. So I hope this has helped you know a little bit more about tornadoes. 
Obviously, I've had a little bit of experience, um, although I have to say I've, I've never been actually in a tornado. None of, none of my um, personal family has had property or, or their home destroyed by one. Um, I do know a little bit about them, and, and because I've lived in Texas all my life, I'm not really all that fearful of them. Uh, again, as long as you stay alert, you listen to the weather, you know what to watch for, and you take precautions when one is coming, um, I'm not going to say that they're not deadly because they are, uh, and that you shouldn't be afraid because you, you, you need to have a um, kind of a healthy attitude about tornadoes. You know, you do need to have some fear, but you also need to have some knowledge and be prepared. So this has been uh, this episode. It kind of concludes this episode of Texas Talking. I hope you've enjoyed it and you know a little more about tornadoes now. If you were a, a Texan and lived here all your life, you probably had a lot of this information. Uh, but it's always fun to kind of relive some of those stories. If you are not a Texan, you just moved to Texas, maybe this will give you um, a healthy glimpse into what you can do to be prepared and stay safe. During. Please join us again in two weeks for more stories, interviews, and legends from Texas. Thank you so much for joining me. You can find the show notes from this episode and how to become a patron of the podcast at texastalkin.com. Don't miss an episode. Please subscribe to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Patreon, or wherever you get your podcasts. Follow Texas Talkin on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. And subscribe to the Texas Talking YouTube channel. Thank you for listening. And until next time, see you then.